Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, he is freshly cut. So if you're if you're if you're only listening on the uh, on the podcast, you're not watching on the YouTube. You're you're missing out. He looks looks even more handsome than, than normal, which is saying something. Um, he is the Knicks beat writer for the Athletic. Um, wrapping up his first season on the beat, I can't wait to hear what his impressions are, Mister Fred Katz. Hello, sir. How you doing? Thanks for having me on again. Thank you for thank you not only for this for coming on consistently throughout this entire year. Um, this has not been a particularly fun team to talk about, but yet you drag yourself back again and again and again to discuss, you know, things. And I appreciate it as the it as keeps the me fans. sharp. I have random observations that are good on podcasts, but they they don't work when you write them. When you write them, it just seems so final like there are there are levels of officialness i feel like carving them is definitely number one like there's a reason the ten commandments are literally written in stone you know because that's just so official they weren't gonna like send a telegram with the ten commandments that's very official and then like writing is more official than just kind of shooting the shit on a podcast can i say shooting the shit you can say shooting any shooting the shit shooting the the uh, what are the I mean it really only works for shooting the show. That's I was the one. Throw in another curse. Well, word. I said it. They sh- <laughs> That's something you can't do in the athletic. No, I can I can curse. I can I can say any curse word if I'm quoting somebody else. Uh, what was the tweet? What was the what was the? Uh, you got to write motherfucker in a tweet earlier this year because one of the Knicks said motherfucker, right? I I would imagine they would. It's it's the kind of season where somebody's saying motherfucker. So no, but I, I, okay, I know I'm not making this up. Where you, it was it was clearly it was a quote, and every beat writer, I think it was it might have been Julius, or maybe it was a mother. It was something. It oh, was when Julius a, said, "Shut the fuck up." To the that's fans. what. Thank you, and Andrew just typed it in. Yes, shut yeah. the fuck up. There you go. That's what it was. I don't know why I thought motherfucker. Anyway, so now that we've gotten all of our curse words out, we've been given whatever rating by the uh, the FCC. Um, let's talk about this wonderful team. Actually, it's perfect. That's a perfect uh, segue. My first question to you was going to be, um, when you think back of your first season covering the Knicks, I don't know, several months, several years from now, whatever, like, cause for me, like every, I think back to every Knicks season and I could like kind of wrap it up in one second, one sentence, like, Oh, it's the year that KP, you know, tore his ACL or, you know, it's the year that they intentionally tanked and thought they were getting KD or, it was the fun 12, 13 year or, uh, you know, any the all the year Isaiah made, you know, traded for Eddie Curry, like all these different things. When you when you think back to this year, are you going to have like one one easy descriptor that you'll be able to refer back to this year with? I don't know it. You know, I don't know. I think it depends on what happens next year. I think what happens next year helps define whatever the heck this year was. Like if, if, if RJ Barrett comes out next year and averages 23 points a game on 56% true shooting, I think we'll say get into existence. I think we'll say this is the year that RJ Barrett started to become a really good player. Like, I think that's what we'll remember this year for. It won't be looked at as so dire. It'll be like, Oh, that was the year that RJ really started to make, the leap. And then if RJ averages 23 a game next year on 56% true shooting and people are like, RJ might be most improved, then all the snotty Knicks fans are going to be like, well, actually, he really started to do this at the end of last year. You know, all those good, really good, annoying good, good people. Good nasally voice, by the way. Yeah. All those yeah. really annoying people who are like, look at what Christian Wood is doing in Detroit in 2020. Unbelievable. And then people are like, well, he played seven games with New Orleans last year and had incredible per 36 numbers. <laughs> And they'll do the same with RJ. So, so that's what this year will be. If RJ is if. really good or okay. if quickly is really good, or, you know, like if like all the young guys just kind of as a, as a conglomerate end up really developing into something good. I don't think this year retrospectively has to be looked at as some giant fallback, but, but it also could just be that year that Julius Randall totally completely regressed or it could just be that random blip in the radar year if they're decent i i honestly don't know maybe the answer is it's that weird year where a lot of weird crap happened maybe that's what it is i'm, I'm just I, talking it out now no I, I like it because like to me 
like last year, I'm always going to think of as the, you know, the we here slash big 15 year. And if you're being honest with yourself as a Knicks fan, it's like, it is kind of the year that everything went right. You know, it's like perfect. The, the, the group gel, like they played for the coach, like obviously Julius did what Julius did. And like, I'm starting to think like of this is the year where again, it, we, could totally change this depending on what happens moving forward. And like, there is young talent here and that young talent has a chance to be pretty good, especially RJ. Um, But it is kind of the year where, I mean, I don't want to say everything went wrong, but a lot went wrong. Um, You just referenced Julius. You wrote, you've had a lot of bangers this year. It's my favorite thing that you have written um, on the season when you were getting into the nitty gritty of uh, Julius Randall's shooting drop off. Um, Let's start with him. Would you care to put into words like uh, a little bit of, of your findings from that piece from, I think it was from last week, right? Yeah. You are the target audience for that piece. Aren't you? I thought you, you could have started that with like, dear, dear John. John. Yeah. Dear, yeah. <laughs> there you go. What can I say? Dearest Jonathan. I write you from the bowels of the garden where Julius Randall has just missed a fadeaway 12 footer. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, a lot of those misses. Yeah. I mean, that story that you're referencing was, was really just about, I think a lot, you know, narrative has kind of become a curse word in sports. Yes. And for the most part, I don't like that. People use it as demeaning. They say, Oh, <laughs> That's what the narrative is, meaning that's what these people who frame the story yet don't really know the truth of what's going on are saying. It's a shot at the media, too. Let's just say it because it's like, well, they're writing about it and thus that's making it true as opposed to they're writing about it because it is true and they are expanding upon it. I throw that out there. Yes. And also like narratives, it bothers me. You know, fans can say whatever. That stuff doesn't really bother me. It bothers me when media people say it. Because we shouldn't be demeaning narratives. Our job is to tell narratives. Narratives are good. They're stories. They're the crap that people want to read. So I don't like when people are like, well, the narrative is this. That said, I'm going to say that right now. I think the narrative this year has been more about Randall's demeanor. And we can talk about the the leadership, all the, the fines, the leadership, all the, all the intangible stuff, the, 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 the thumbs down at the crowd, like that has kind of been this symbol of Julius Randall's season. But to me, I don't know. I think this is, this probably says more about the way that I personally watch the game and cover the team and cover the league than it does about maybe what's happening. But at least to me personally, the story of Julius Randle's season has not really been any of that stuff. It's been the fact that he is not the same basketball player that he was last year. And I've tried to reflect that in, in my coverage. I've written stuff about his decision-making and I've written stuff about why he hasn't been the same basketball player. And ultimately what the Knicks have to recover. And I, I wanted to write about the story that you referenced. I wanted to write it in reference to, okay, there's all this stuff about if the Knicks were to make Julius Randle available, what would his value be? What would other teams think of him? And I don't think other teams care about the thumbs down stuff. I think there are 29 teams who would be like, ah, change of scenery. It's just not working in New York to bring him in. That stuff's off the table. I just don't think it really, it really affects his value. What does affect his value when you're talking about a team potentially pursuing him in a trade and this is all hypothetical. I'm not saying the Knicks are definitely going to trade him. I, no, I you're, you're, the aggregators are, are going to get you. It's too late. Yes, I, but I, I have to say that. Uh, what, what, what people are going to care about, what other teams are going to care about is the basketball. And, and the reality is the basketball has not been the same. And, and where it all starts is the fact that kind of out of nowhere, last year, he became this excellent jump shooter. Shot 41% from three. Shot 42% from mid range on the extremely difficult types of mid range shots that he likes to take. Those, yep. those fall away, you know, over the left shoulder, 
you know, contested shots that he likes to take at 12, 14 feet. And, and he was making a ton of them. Which and defenses that, they needed to respect. And it set up a domino effect. Exactly. Yeah. Sets up his passing, sets up his drives, sets up his efficiency. And he took fewer shots at the rim last year, yep. percent like ratio wise compared to, the, you know, the like 16% of his shots, one in six of his shots were at the rim last year, which is the lowest ratio of his entire career. He propped up his game last year because of the way he was shooting. And this year, as I detailed in that story, he's basically been of anyone who regularly takes jump shots. He's basically been other than, than Jalen Suggs. He has basically been the worst jump shooter in the entire league this year. And that is a really big problem when he is accounting for the plurality of your offense. Um, and that's what other teams yeah. are going to see. And they were skeptical about his jumper coming into the year about if last year was real. And, and this is only going to confirm people who were skeptical. This is only going to confirm that skepticism. And I actually think it's even a little bit more worrisome because, it, and you had a, another great piece earlier in the year in which you, I mean, you've had a lot of great pieces here, but it, about Julius in particular, but like, you know, you talk about him posting up 18 feet or more sometimes from the basket as like, why, what, what, what is the reason for that? And like the fact, obviously we, we all know he doesn't um, drive to the rim. Like if you look at his rim numbers, they're not even that, I mean, I shouldn't be saying this out loud because I don't know, but I don't think any other teams listen to this, this dingy podcast, but like, you know, like he's not that great at the rim. Like the only times in his career, he's been good at the rim has been when he's played alongside of a, a stretch five. And you've, I know you've pointed this out in the past. So like, I, I I'm almost at the point where I, I pitched a fake trade in the newsletter today, sent him to Charlotte for, for something built around Gordon Hayward's contract, because at least Charlotte has shown the willingness to play fives who don't protect the rim at all. And just, we're going to go all in on offense. Like I, I just, I don't know what the, and you pitched some great trades at the end of your piece, which I don't, you know, people should go read that um, or maybe not specific trades, but like the idea of, of a trade for Randall gun to your head. You think he gets moved this summer or, or, or do you think they just, there's, they're not going to get what they want. I think it's possible. I think if somebody calls them and says they want to talk, I want to talk about Julius Randall. I think that that phone is not hanging up. Yes. If I had to guess, you know, I threw out a bunch of different possibilities for trades. If I had to guess, I think the most likely scenario, at least as of today, and you know how this goes, yeah. like stuff changes quickly. But I, I would guess the most likely scenario is he is on the Knicks at the start of next season. Because I just, I don't think you can really get anything for him right now. I don't think there are a lot of teams who see value in what he does and something I considered throwing in that story, which I, which I didn't because it just, it just kind of made it too long, but it's worth talking about is can, can he, if he is going to play this way, can he operate as anything other than a number one option? I, I, th I think it all the time. And if he is your number one option, then what is the ceiling on your offense? Because if he, if your number one option has a 46% true uh, effective field goal percentage, then your offense is going to be in trouble, especially if that guy also struggles against double teams like Randall does. So you're, you're just, you're going to have a ceiling on your offense. That's real low. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's it like your the ceiling on your offense is gonna is gonna make for a room that only four year olds can walk into, you know. Like it's just gonna be a real it's gonna be like a real problem. Good. So like that's that's really where you're at. One of those things has to change. Either his his habits have to change, or the jump shooting has to pick up. Can, can I throw something at you real quick, please? In terms of his habits, it's almost like given his strengths, he would be better served. Instead of not moving at all, which I don't want to be too harsh, but kind of he doesn't really move a lot in the Knicks offense. He just likes to be where he is and do what he does. Instead of that, doing the opposite, move a lot, operate in the pick and roll a lot, you know, set screens, move after you set a screen <laughs> as opposed to just screen and like post up, you know, and the player that I'm describing, guess who does all that shit playing power forward for the New York Knicks? It's the guy backing him up, you know, and it's like, it's not like we don't have the blueprint. The blueprint's right there for how Julius needs to operate to be a successful basketball player. 
a lot of people have blamed Tibbs for uh, whether you want to say not instilling or, or, or instituting that version of the offense when Julius is in there for not holding Julius feet to the fire and making him do that. Like, where do you come down on that side of it? Like, we know what he needs to do. Why? Do, who do you blame for him not doing it? It's probably a little bit of both. I mean, look, I think anyone who follows the Knicks at this point knows that Tibbs is not over there critiquing every single Julius Randle flaw. Like, I think we know that. I think we see that. I think we can tell from the way that he talks about him, uh, from the way that he talks about Randall's tendencies and all those things. He just addresses Randall differently than he does everybody else on the team. So when Julius Randall continues to do the same stuff all the time, I think that's part of it. That being said, there have been times throughout this year where I've kind of asked Randall open-ended questions, things like, how would you evaluate your defense this year? Uh, or, you know, you're, you're shooting, you know, 28% the last four games or whatever. He's gone through a shooting slump. What do you think of the quality of looks you're getting? How would you evaluate the quality of looks you're getting? And for the most part, he just kind of responds that like they're good looks. I like the looks or I think my defense has been pretty good and that kind of stuff. And I just, I don't know. Look, there's some guys who just don't like talking about that stuff publicly and they address things privately and they just kind of, I don't want to say lie because lie implies a malcontent and it's, it's not malicious. Yeah. It's not, it's just to kind of shield themselves because uh, they're just not good in those public settings. And that's fine and understandable. And I don't know if that's what he's doing and he's addressing it privately, but all I can take from that is you're shooting 28%. You've, you've been the most inaccurate mid range shooter in the, of, of, you know, in the league this year, and you're taking a ton of mid range shots. What do you think of the looks you're getting? I think they're good looks. All I can take from that is that he and I have a completely different definition of what good looks are. <laughs> uh, and, and so, so, you know, I, I think, I think there, I think it's probable that there's not necessarily a, a recognition of, of the things that you and I probably deem to be flaws with, with him specifically on this team. Isn't and that, the and that does make me part? wonder about how they're going to recover it for sure. How, that, that doesn't that have to be the most worrisome part? Because if there's no, sure. isn't it? Sure. Was yeah. it step one? Is admitting ever like? I I just don't know where you're supposed to go if you're the Knicks. Like that's why I'm not. I don't want to. I don't question your. If you had to pick right now, he's going to be back next season because I think gun to my head, I'd probably agree with you. But if I'm the Knicks, how? If you have a guy here who's not willing to admit that there are serious issues here, like how do you go forward with that? And I just, I just don't know the. I don't think there is an answer, but I. You know. Yeah, I I don't know. I guess you just try you try really hard. Also, <laughs> there's there's crossed. there's also the possibility of like he's just better next year. Yeah. You know, he's just yeah. he's just better. He just yeah. he just runs back more in transition, or instead of shooting thirty four percent from mid range, he he just he shoots thirty nine. Like yeah. that's not an unbelievable number. Or instead of shoot 30 from three, he shoots 35, you know, like, and all of a sudden that's, these are just normal numbers. It, it would be reasonable to expect him to shoot 35 from three on four or five, three point attempts a game and, and 38, 39 from mid range, you know, like it's just, that's, that's a realistic possibility as well. That just like last year was, was probably, I, I think it's a, there's a pretty good chance that ends up being the best season he ever plays. I think it's so. also possible. I don't think this is his norm either. Like, no. yeah. you know, we, he is so much worse than he was, you know, even that like solo se- that one season that he did in new Orleans, yeah. like he was, he was a good player that season. You know, it's not like Average he was 20 like points a game. Yeah. Right. It's not like new Orleans was 10 points per hundred possessions worse when he was on the floor like the Knicks are right like, now. I was about to say like the Knicks are right like he was a good player and it's not for for those who wasn't what for those who weren't watching New Orleans that season it wasn't a situation like this where it's like you see that he's averaging 20 10 and 5 and you watch the games and it it just yeah. doesn't match up with those counting stats like no you watch the games he was active he was getting to the rim the efficiency stats were actually quite good he had like a 60 something percent true shooting that year which is like a, that's like a like a legitimately really good number like he was very efficient yes uh so like he is capable of being good even if he doesn't play at the level and in the style that he did last year there are other versions of julius randall that exist beyond the one last year and beyond the one this year and I think there's a very realistic situation where he comes back next year. He feels refreshed and just like, just 
plays better. And if he just comes back and he just plays better, then someone's going to be like, it's not as horrible of a contract as people say it is. No, it, it's not. I, it's no, not I don't. I agree with expensive. that. Expensive. Yeah. No, it's not. He's, he's, you know, as many have said, he's about the 50th highest paid player in the league this year, which, you know, if you go look at the salaries that are around him, um, you know, it's, it's not nuts, you know, assuming you could find the right role. Um, we'll see. I mean, you wrote it a few days ago he, uh, about how he said he loves being in New York. Well, like, I guess we'll, we'll find out if he gets a chance to, to further prove that. Um, you also wrote uh, recently uh, after probably their, their most feel good win of the season, I would say in Miami um, about uh, a, a more pleasant topic, which is the young Knicks. And you had this, you opened the story um, with this absolutely wonderful anecdote uh, involving Kyle Lowry and Deuce McBride and uh, how, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a respect uh, there. Um, and I just, you know, that's why the the Randall conversation to me is so frustrating because there is this whole other segment of the team, right? That is just, yeah, I know this is your first year covering, but I could tell you the Knicks have not had a young core like this um, since I, it's been decades. It, it's, you know, you have to go back a really long way. Um, you've covered the league a long time. You're, you're, you're a historian of the game. What are your thoughts on this on this young core? And if you want to um, expand upon that that Lowry story, feel feel free as well. Yeah, uh, I think it's pretty good, but but it's it's a lot of it's more quantity yes. than quality. You know, there's no John Morant in the building there's, right now. Exactly. They, I I don't think they have a superstar. Uh, I just don't. I could could RJ make an All Star team one day? Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 possible. I think. I think he can uh, make a few. I, I mean, I I'm not. There are people out there who think he's going to be like a six time All NBA level player. Right. I'm that's not going to be tough. That's going to be a little difficult. That's going to be tough. He's going to be yeah. a good player. Yeah, for sure. He'll be a good player. But but you know how good of a player is yet to be seen. And look, I don't think there are people in the NBA outside of New York who are expecting RJ to be a six time all NBA player. I, I would agree I just, with that statement. Maybe, maybe, maybe in Canada, but other than that, <laughs> I don't think why do you hate RJ Barrett, Fred? Why do you hate yeah. him? It's, He's going to be a good player. He is a good player. Yeah. He's going to be a better player. And, and I could see him making all-star teams for sure, but that's, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot to put on RJ. I know he puts it on himself for yeah. sure. He has very high ambitions for himself and that's great, but he, you know, it's just, this just a lot to put on, on him. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, he's not, he's not a jazz level, you know? Um, so, so I would, yeah, I mean, I would say it's, it's quality, but it's missing like the guy, you know, like quickly is a, is a good player. He's going to be a good player, but they don't have that guy who's just like guaranteed all-star level sort of thing. Obi's going to be a good rotation player. I think on the whole, they've drafted pretty well. Like Grimes yeah. is a really good pick in the twenties. Quickly is a really good pick in the twenties. Uh, and they're kind of set up to have a good rotation for a long time, but it's just like, I don't know what the ceiling, I mean, I'll ask you, like, what do you think the ceiling, if this core is the main part of a rotation and you just add a, a few other, just like really good rotation pieces. Like you don't, you don't add Donovan Mitchell. You don't add yeah. Carl Anthony towns. You just add other good rotation pieces. Like how good is this team? Like, I think we've seen kind of an example of how good this team is so far. I think it's better than 35 and 44, but well, that that's it's funny you just said that number because it came up on a post game the other day where it was like let's just say we ship out Julius and get nothing back and you know let's I think I Andrew maybe could chime in I I don't I think in this scenario it was like let's imagine they get Jalen Brunson um it, where and I was I was asked like how many games does that team win so like basically Jalen Brunson and like the young core and maybe you keep. Burks or Fournier or, you know, even both of them. Um, and I was like, I don't know. I think it wins about 35 games, you know, maybe stays in the play in race. Right. Am I misremembering Andrew? Well, or? so the, the context of the question was more like, can Tibbs get 40 wins out of oh, okay. said team? So I, basically like, who's the net 
Yes. Is the net gain of losing Julius different than the net gain of firing Tibbs? And I was a and I was a little welcome dubious. to our post games, you know. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I was a little dubious because I, you know, you are oftentimes in the NBA how good your best player is. And like, yes, I know there are exceptions to that rule. I mean, look at Memphis's record without uh you know, John Morant, look, even and Phoenix when in the games that like Booker and Chris Paul missed, like they were like, you, you can, you can rise to the level of like, but I, that's so hard. And it's so, it's so rare. And I think it also da- diminishes like how good a players on, on both of those, you know, rosters yeah, are also like, like Jaron Jackson Jr. is freaking he's really awesome. good. Like yeah. Jaron Jackson Jr. is like first team all defense. Good. Now he should be in the defensive player of the year. Uh, yeah. At least you can in the throw conversation. him on a ballot. That's you know, fine. He's been the best rim protector in the NBA this year, probably. Eh, speaking, Rudy Gobert, second best. Yeah. Speaking of uh, guys who might make an all star team one day, Des Bain is probably going to. We're, yeah, exactly. I guarantee you there's going to be a year where we have the Des Bain, is he an all star conversation? It might be next year. <laughs> it might be, yeah, right. It might be Desmond Bain might be. He, he, you, could, you could sit here right now and tell me that you think Desmond Bain should win most improved player. And I'd be like, okay. It, it, my only argument. Us. My only argument against it would be that I probably don't vote for second year guys, but that's not an argument against Desmond Bain. He's really good. So, the, so the like, point is, Memphis is very good. Uh, Phoenix is is very good. So, like, does this does this you know group have that level? I'm I'm a little bit. It would really take a bigger leap from I think RJ and quickly and Obi. I think those are the three guys that I would have to circle. Like, all three of these guys are going to come in next year. And maybe not blow away expectations, but like somewhat significantly exceed expectations. And that's, you know, it's a lot to ask. Yeah. I mean, you know how you know that group doesn't have that level. Those guys on the Grizzlies are all the same age as the Knicks. And look at, <laughs> look at what they're doing. Like, yeah. like John ja Morant was the same draft as RJ, you know, like I'm even Zy- job Zy- goes Zy- aside. Is, yeah. Zyra Zy- Williams is a, is a, is a rookie and is playing really well. And Jaron Jackson Jr. is 22 years old. Like he's two years younger than Obi Toppin. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, these, these guys are Desmond Bain is 23. He's a little on the older side, but yeah, I think yeah. he's 23. 23 or okay. Older side. I mean, like he's this, he's, he's, you know, a year older than, than quickly and, yeah. and, and a year younger than Obi. And it's like, he, he's the same, you know, year younger than Mitch, Mitch, 24, 23. I think Mitch is 20. I think he's 24. He's, a, he's like six months older than my, but my point yeah. is, if he were on the team, he'd be part of the young core. It's like these guys are are all part of that. So, you know, when we talk about like elite young cores, like it starts with Memphis. I think the Knicks have good quantity, which is just great. It's nice to have a lot of good young players. I'm, I'm more skeptical on some of them than Knicks Twitter is. Like I'm, I'm more skeptical. Don't, on don't make guy. enemies, Fred. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nick's Twitter talks about Miles McBride like, oh, my God, don't trade him for John Morant if you get offered that. I, and I'm like, I don't know, dude, shooting 29 percent. Can we wait and see? I, like, can we just can we just wait and see every single jumper that he takes? His release is in a different place. Like, can we can we can we wait and 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 just and just see first before we say that they shouldn't trade him for Kevin Durant if the Nets offer it? <laughs> Can we just, can we just take a deep breath? Fred, I, I had, can we I just had take a, a deep, wait, no, wait. Can we just no, take we a can't. deep breath and be like, and be like, Hey, you know what? Maybe it's not a rite of passage for a second round pick to be guaranteed 30 minutes a night, no matter what. Maybe that's not a rite of passage. But, but Fred, Alec Burks has been the worst player in the NBA. Did you not know this? <laughs> Look, I, I understand the Alec Burks frustration specifically in relation to like, if you want to start quickly at the point. At yeah. This point. Yeah. And like that's that, valid. And the, and the crunch valid. time stuff is valid because Alec Burks has the, the crunch time numbers for Alec Burks are almost comical. They're so bad. It's all, it's almost as if he's getting paid to throw these games when you look at the negative, but other than that, and other than the fact that yes, he's starting in place of quickly, which upsets a lot of people like Alec Burks has been one of the better players on the Knicks this year. Alec <laughs> you know, Burks is a good player. He's a good player. Yeah. He's just playing out of position. That too. <laughs> Alec Burks is a good player. Also, how how I, I I'm glad we're getting into this. This is this is one of the things where I didn't I'm even like, intend to get into this. I'm so I happy need we to are. I need to talk about this. I know I did though. I needed to talk about this because I, I I I just can't find a way to write about it that doesn't sound like preachy. So I'm just gonna say it and sound Dude, preachy. Get on your pulpit, uh, man. <laughs> Can we just reframe the Alec Burks conversation? I, I've like, been trying not, to all year. I'm not trying to sound like a total incomplete Tibbs apologist here, but like 
at one point earlier this year, I forget who might have been me who asked another beat writer asked about about at what point you change the starting lineup from Burks. And Tib said something along the lines to paraphrase, like, this is the best we got. What you see is what we got. And he got killed for that. Oh, how could you say that? How is he wrong? Like that, that is, if, if you want to say quickly, that's great. I'm not talking about quickly. Yep. But like, even if you're doing that, you're just flipping them. Like then Burks is just the backup point guard. There's not a scenario in which Alec Burks is not going to run your offense for a little while. Like what? it's just like, I, I believe in, in proportioning blame in different directions when things aren't going right. It's usually not a hundred percent someone's fault, but like how has the conversation so flipped to where this is an Alec Burks and a Tom Thibodeau problem. And that's it. And it doesn't involve a conversation about the roster construction where they just don't have a point guard. And they brought in two point guards who are in their thirties, who we knew were going to miss significant time for injuries because of their injury histories. And, and yet it just, Fred, the you, public you missed, blame has been shoved onto Fred, you and forgot Tibbs. You forgot about the guy we spent the first 15 minutes of the show talking about how you should point to me, the team in NBA history that had a player as its nominal best player be arguably, arguably the worst, or let me rephrase that, the most detrimental high usage player in the sport that went well, out and won, I, I don't how many games, do, you know. I am going to point you in the direction of the Los Angeles Lakers. Okay, please. And I'm going to say that, I don't know if Julius Randle is the most detrimental this year. Oh, that's okay. There might be a guy <laughs> on the Los Angeles Lakers. Higher, who is, hi, higher effect. Who is not having his best Julius. season. I believe by a hair, he has a higher, not that that's everything. He, he, he's, worked. he's, he's got slightly better efficiency numbers than Randall. Yeah. But there's more, there's other things he does. Great. That are, Great. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what's happened over there. And compare, <laughs> damn it. And again, that team has LeBron fucking. <laughs> James, they have LeBron James and and Andy Davis, who's not bad. Um, I know the rest of their roster isn't particularly good, but like, listen, I, I did not pay you to say anything you just said. We didn't even talk about this before the show, but this has been what I've been preaching for months. And the pushback that I get is that, well, it's still Tibbs' fault because Tibbs is the coach and Tibbs is coaching Randall and Tibbs can't corral Randall or Tibbs can't, you know, hold Randall accountable and he's giving him all these minutes. And like, I think that's all valid. And which is why I said, I think if you look at Tom Thibodeau's career, you could argue this is the worst job he's done coaching a team because look, the proof is in the pudding that they haven't succeeded. And I'm sure there's things he probably would have done differently. But when it's when it comes time to like, where does the fault originate? Tom Thibodeau has done a poor job dealing with not great circumstances. He did not create the bad circumstances unless I'm missing something. And apparently, or it seems like you agree more with me here. Yeah, I think, I think I agree. I, I look shockingly, there's, there's not a lot of nuance in this conversation. And, and I, <laughs> I, I think where I land is just like a lot of people had bad years this year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think Tibbs wasn't as good this year as he was last year. hundred percent. Randall wasn't as good this year as he was last year. And I think the roster construction, which starts with Leon Rose and goes throughout the rest of the front office, uh, was not as good as it was last year. Uh, By the way, the defense, for all the talk of they have terrible defenders and, and, and they ruin their defense and all that stuff, defense is like 11th in points allowed per possession right now. Go go look at the numbers with Kemba off the floor. Best net rating, best defensive rating in the league. Yeah, I have looked. And that's 75% of the team's minutes. It's not like it's that's what the Julius on off numbers. I feel bad throwing them out there because it's, it's a a small, much smaller sample size. The Kemba numbers, that's three quarters of the year that we're talking about in terms of the total minutes. And you look at the net rating with him off and the net rating last year, it's the same number. It's no different. Yeah. No, Kemba, Kemba is a good microcosm of how, Tibbs kind of sometimes can't catch a break (laughs) where like when he benched Kemba and I'm not saying it's the same people who came for him. I just think it's funny. Like when, when he benched Kemba in November, he got annihilated for benching Kemba. How could you wrong Kemba? 
Yeah. And then Kemba came back and he went for 44 against the Wizards. He had yeah. triple double against the Hawks. He had 29 against Boston in the first game back. And it was like, oh my God, look at what Tibbs has been depriving them of the whole time. Look at Kemba. Tibbs refused to make it work. Look how terrible that's been. And look how terribly he handled it. And then when Kemba fell off and he continued to have Kemba in the lineup, it was like, why will Tibbs play Kemba? Why, why, or why won't Tibbs sit Kemba? Yeah. Why is he so inflexible about this? It's like he already benched him for 10 games. Uh, and it's just, um, I don't know. Look, you want to, you want to, I mean, we can talk about the things that Tibbs has not done great. Cause I do agree with the, the criticism of like, he hasn't helped the Randall situation. No. Um, I and the Kemba benching, I think was I, maybe I'm sure you've heard a lot of the stuff that's been reported, you know, you, firsthand is that I, that didn't sound like it was handled particularly great. Uh, no. Oh God. No. I mean, not from the way that Kemba talks about it. It sounds like there just wasn't really any communication there. And that was definitely a problem. Like the, I think there have been communication problems all around. Like I, I'm not the only one who's reported that like just with the Cam Reddish stuff, like how he didn't, he was not down for the Reddish trade when it happened. And, and then they traded for Reddish and then he didn't play Reddish until, you know, he, there were enough guys hurt to where he had to play Reddish. So like, you know, that was, that's, that's another thing where it's like, I don't really know who that's the, there's something messed up organizationally with that. I, I don't know who gets it, but there's just, there's something messed up organizationally with that. They, they when there's just not a same pagedness in that situation. Yeah. And, and look, communication problems with the front office, communication problems, even sometimes with players tend to follow him around through his career. When you yes, talk to do. people like that is that is a theme that there there there's there's communication stuff. But like not all of this stuff is like, I don't know, I'm not a huge believer in 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 scapegoat. Normally, there's an actual reason why something works and an actual reason why something doesn't work. And I'd rather just sit here and be, and say, I don't know. To something than uh, than just name a scapegoat for the sake of naming a scapegoat with this stuff. Oh, I appreciate that. By the um, way, yeah. I, Mc, Deuce McBride could become good. Oh, he could I be just great. Don't think he. I just I just don't think he he should play forty eight minutes a game and, just because he is a young person. And I'll and I'll even again I'm you know King Thibodeau supporter. I'll even push back on something you said a minute ago about the starting quickly thing. And it's the same difference. Like, uh, what game was it? Um, a recent game. I think maybe the no, was it the Hornets game? It was some game, whatever, where they he took quickly out. Oh, it was the one we were watching on uh on playback, I think, Andrew, when they he took quickly out with like five minutes left and put him back in with like three minutes left and afterwards basically intimated like he needed a he needed a break because he was he had been playing like 12 straight minutes. Well, that's not but it might be less of an issue if you start him because then you're you know, you're starting him at the beginning of the third quarter, and then you could obviously bring him in earlier in the fourth. But even then, it's like the Knicks make so many of these many of these pushes, like to start the fourth quarter against, by the way, opposing teams' backups, which is like that's the other part where I feel like when you and I do it, I'm guilty of this, where you throw out net ratings and stuff, and it's like, well, you know, there is a little bit of context in terms of who these numbers are being compiled against. So I don't know, it's complicated. Yes, for sure. Net. Net ratings are great if you put them in a greater context. Yes. Uh, I don't think you can just throw them out there with nothing. Otherwise, you're going to look at Deuce McBride and think I was about to say, the league. <laughs> Deuce McBride his, is the his third His plus best minus therapy. numbers are obscene. Yeah. Since the, his since plus the minus numbers are amazing. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not arguing he hasn't done this. He's had some really good moments. He was so yeah. good in that fourth quarter against Miami. Yeah, the energy is really great. Hard and, yeah. Yeah. The energy is great. And, 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 uh, but, you know, he's just, he's, offensively it's like the the to me it's more it's it's the jumper but it's also the feel like you know him him and quickly like i wrote a little nugget earlier this year about yeah. how quickly isn't really passing to him that much and i i think just based on this is total lie test i don't know if the numbers back it up but it seems like they have that ironed out a little bit more quickly is finding him a little more uh but one of the things that i'm just kind of curious about and this is another thing like i don't know the answer to is like how much when he's out there with quickly, it's like quickly runs the offense the whole time. Yep. And I think the common uh, reaction to that is they, they, this proverbial, they don't let Deuce McBride do anything to initiate. And Fred, the, like, the game tells you what to do, Fred. You didn't know that. Well, I, <laughs> that one's amazing. I, 
I don't it's know how <laughs> I don't know how much of it is that they are just dis- whether it's, you know, quickly, you know, quickly is obviously ball dominant. And like how much of it is Deuce is just like let quick do his thing. He's ball dominant. He feels like he 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 doesn't want to take an initiative or quickly is just so ball dominant. He doesn't have the opportunity to take an di- initiative or it's Tib saying, this is the role we want you in. The coaching staff saying, we, we want you parked there. This is what we want you doing. Or how much of it is just, you know what? Send them out there, let them play, and the chips are going to fall where they fall. And the guys are going to fall into the roles where they're the most natural doing. And McBride's just not taking the reins on his own. And it could be any of those things. I don't. We don't know. I don't know. It's just, I I, I don't know why it's happening. I, I haven't. I haven't seen enough of him. Uh, so I just, I don't, I don't know enough about his tendencies. I haven't seen enough NBA minutes of him. So, uh, you know, it could be, it could be a number of, of, of reasons why, but, you know, I think, I think offensively, like, like I remember last year, I mean, the, the greatest example of this I can think of, it's like, I was covering, uh, Russell Westbrook and Denny Avdia last year. And, and what Denny was, Denny was the, Denny was the wizards first round pick. He was a rookie. Yeah. It was the ninth pick in the draft and the Wizards started him for most of the season, but he played his minutes next to Russell Westbrook. And so Denny, when he came in was, you know, six, nine point forward, can do stuff off the dribble, run the break pass. And that was the MO on him. And the Wizards just kind of parked him in the corner and Russell Westbrook ran the show. And part of it was just part of the, the way that the, the, the blame game formed was okay. The coaching staff is just parking Denny in the corner. Why are they doing that? And also, Denny doesn't have an opportunity to touch the ball when Russell Westbrook is on the floor. And I do believe that uh, those were things that happened and those were contributive factors. But there was also the fact of like, there were a lot of times where Denny would get the ball at the top of the key and he could initiate. There was a lane for him to go downhill. There was a lane for him to go at the rim. And he just kind of gave it up. Uh, because he was a rookie and he didn't have feel and he didn't have comfort and he, and he didn't have that uh, assertiveness. To- Fred, you, you, you missed the four years worth of the Frank Milikina experience here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where we, I, I mean, we would have the same, I can't tell you how many times we would have the same conversation about like, Oh, they're, they're holding Frank back. How's, how's Frank doing? I, I've seen a lot of DMPs being racked up with the Dallas Mavericks, you know, this year. Uh, I, I don't, Last I checked, uh, Frank's usage wasn't uh, wasn't in the 30s uh, in Dallas. It's like the play like players are going to find their role that they're meant to find. And again, I'm not I don't want to. This is not I, this is going to sound like we're crapping on deuce. Pun intended. Um, we're not. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Andrew. Um, he's he could be really good. And 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 I think part of this is like uh, t- the frustration of, of a lot of fans is we know what Alec Burks is, you know, it's like, there's no, there's not a lot of mystery. We don't know what Deuce is to your, to your point that you just said before. And it's like, once we already kind of figured out the season was going to be a lost season, there was definitely other organizations. I think you would agree would have pivoted. And this organization either didn't have the wherewithal to, to tell Tibbs who to play or like, chose not to go on that. And we don't, again, more of, we don't know. So I think that's probably where the frustration lies, but it, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, there are certain ones who are going to put that sort of player in. That being said, like, I just don't know. I, I think there has to be some level of, of performance once you're playing is first of all. And second of all, like he has been playing. Yes. It's not like it's he's been in the rotation for a month. It's not like he hasn't been in the rotation. I do believe if he blew up, he would play minutes because other rookies who have gotten into the rotation, even if they were kind of fended off at the beginning, once they got in, if they blew up, they stayed like Quentin Grimes like is one of them. Quentin Grimes. Right. And and I just I don't know. I don't I don't believe in uh, the the whole the whole, well, if, if everybody weren't hurt, would the rookies still be playing? It's like, I I don't know. I'm not going to get all worked up because of a hypothetical that is, that is, that is totally fake and irrelevant to reality. You know, they, they are playing, uh, they're getting their minutes. It doesn't really matter how they're getting their minutes. Uh, I'm not arguing that Tibbs is not prone to, uh, veterans over rookies. 
He absolutely is as much as any coach. Of course he is. Yeah. Mo- yeah, of course he is. You know, I mean, Doc Rivers is the same way. You know, he is so prone. even pop pop pop. You know, that that roster construction has lent itself a little bit more. But even Pop was quoted the other day of saying something like, I'm not going to just play guys to play them like that's not how we do things here. Yep. Yep. No question. I mean, I think that's 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 look. I've covered a lot of teams. This is a theme on every single team I've ever covered. I've covered a lot of coaches. It's a theme on every single coach I've ever covered. It's just coaches prefer reliability. And Tibbs is on the higher end of that. There is no question about that. I, I totally get the the starting quickly thing because I think there are actual reasons beyond development to start quickly. Like I think there are basketball reasons. To start yes. Quickly. That's, that's uh, been my point, which is why I, I get more fired up about that. than I'd like people get mad at me that I don't, I don't harp on the deuce minutes thing. And I, just, I, just, I don't have it in me. The quickly thing, I think there are basketball, like you said, there are basketball reasons for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, and, and the other thing that we have to talk about with deuce is like, he's playing. You know, their organization, most organizations, I actually don't know if the Knicks are like this specifically. I'm sure they are. Most organizations will set minutes goals for their young players. I've never asked this. I, I should ask if the Knicks do this. But most organizations set minute goals for their young players. We want all of our young players to get X amount of minutes on the season. But every organization who I know that does that includes G League minutes. Because those really? count. Okay. Yeah. Because those interesting. count. I didn't know that. You're, you're playing against com. Yeah. You know, this is this is not some. This is just like a sort of internal sort of goal thing. This is how we want to operate. We want this guy to get a thousand minutes. We want all of our young guys to get a thousand minutes this year. We want all of our young guys to get fifteen hundred minutes this year. And that's between the G League and the NBA. And and Deuce is getting those G League minutes. He's getting those G League opportunities, and he's getting opportunity to run offense there. By the way. Yes, he's, he's putting up crazy numbers there. Um, so, I mean, that that helps with development, too. I mean, it was called the D League before it got branded as the Gatorade League. It was the D was was short for development. It was the it was developmental indeed. league. So so, I mean, that 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 helps as well. I just I, I don't I don't buy it as a lost season for most of the young guys. I get the OB. Oh, I don't think so at all. Yeah. I get the OB frustration and I get the quickly frustration from a, he just gives them the best chance to win, but I don't think this is like a stunted developmental thing for quickly. And, and the OB uh, part of it's it, more of a basketball reason. Yes. Com- oh, complete. Well, no, let me look at the evidence. O- uh, Emmanuel quickly started out the year, clearly struggling, trying to figure out the whole point guard thing. And you look at him over the last month, he's been, uh, he looks, looks more like a point guard to me. I don't want to go overboard. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the reality is it, Here's here's an encouraging next thing. Their young players have developed well this year. Like yeah. we've Jericho Sims is a different person than he was in October. I I vividly remember a play where he got the ball on the wing, on the left wing early in October in some random game that he came in. And he looked like he was they were gonna have to pause the game because he was gonna have a panic attack. He had no idea what to do. And now he's just like <laughs> making intuitive passes and swinging yeah. to the corner and he's fun. I and like, like yeah, he, he, he could be a nice, pl- he could be a nice player. Like I would I be he's surprised. A nice yeah. Totally. I would not be surprised if he gave him 16 quality minutes at center next year. That sure. would, that would totally make sense. And you get that the 58th pick. It's, it's a great pick. It's a great find. Uh, and, and he's gotten better. I think quickly is, is better quickly is making reads at the end of the Chicago game. Oh it, yes. It was that pass he made to Alec the, Burks, the in, the Burks corner, in the corner like three, not, not just the fact that three defenders collapsed in on him and he made the kick to the corner. It was that three defenders came in on him hands up and he threw it over the defense, which is a difficult pass for somebody his size. Normally that's like what a six, four, six, 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 seven guy is going to make those cross court passes. If he's able to throw passes over defenses because he just reads it quickly enough, that is no pun intended for me. That that is a huge thing for him. Like I think I think everybody agrees that RJ has developed this year. Yes. Um, you know, I think everybody agrees that Mitchell Robinson has developed this year. Not uh, to get himself paid. He's inconsistent, but but he's better. 
he's developed. He's a better player now. Like I think, I think most of their young guys, and we can have the OB conversation uh, because I, I think I OB, think OB is looks the one. It looks pretty good. He's he's certainly shooting better when he gets time to get into rhythm. I mean, I know these games don't have a whole lot of meaning that he's getting his time in, but I I, I think there was something to the fact that like, hey, the guy who played a ton of minutes at Dayton and like had the offense run through him. What do you know? He feels more comfortable being on the floor more, you know, and even didn't he say it today? Like I'm getting yeah, more did. minutes like that's the difference. Yeah. So, yeah, he did. I think I think Obi is the one we can talk about. Like, OK, would he be in a different place if he were playing more? Sure. That's fair. Um, especially because he said I'm playing more minutes and, and maybe that's why. Uh, but but I, uh, you know, I think for the most part, they're they're young guys of like had good developmental seasons, which like getting back to your original question is. Yeah. I was about to say, tie it up. It's kind of why, like, I don't know what my answer to how I would sum this up is because if two years from now, you know, RJ is a a really good 25 point scorer and quickly is, you know, a six man of the year candidate. And, uh, you know, Jericho Sims is, you know, a high flying, like really good backup center. And, you know, the rest of these guys are just, you know, Obi, Obi Toppin is, is, you know, just kind of what he is now, but you know, a much, you know, just kind of better at everything. And he's shooting. He's a starter. Say it, Fred, give me, give me what I want. He's a starter on the New York Knicks. Come on. You can't give me that. Okay. Here's the thing that confounds me about Obi. He, he doesn't shoot threes. He a bit better of late, but that's fair. I mean, he's shooting 27% from three on the year on the year okay. lately though. Great. Steph Curry he had four, he had four <laughs> threes the other night. So he's a 40% no, I shooter know. now. He is not someone anybody. Game. Yeah. He is not somebody anybody respects from three. We can say that. Yes. Uh, he's not a three point shooter. Uh, he is not like a top notch off the dribble guy. He's got like a couple moves where he's able to just put his head down. He does that little spin around the hoop and gets that little baby hook. And, yep. but he's not, he's not really a guy who's going to take you off the dribble and he's, he's not a top notch defender. So it's like, if you're going to be a big and you don't have any of those three things, even really at any of those three things at plus levels, then it's kind of what, What are you then? But the thing that continually throws me off about Obi is that, and this is my personal belief, I I think the most underrated skill in basketball is the ability to make good decisions quickly. Yep. If you have 10 guys who make good decisions quickly, then you are going to overperform all the time. And Obi is really good at making good decisions quickly. He just like is always doing something and it's enough so that it just kind of overpowers everything else. But I don't know if that means like, I I don't know if that is going to be such a great skill for him that it's going to overpower the other deficiencies that he has. If he's unable to improve a sufficient amount in those deficiencies, like I, I, I don't know in which case he might just be like a, a really good rotation player uh, or, or a helpful rotation player or, or something along those lines, as, as opposed to just like, this is a starter who you can plug into any team and he's a starter. I, Cause like you, you need those skills, you know? If the shooting doesn't come around in a somewhat significant way, I'm not saying he has to be like a 40% shooter from deep, but if the shooting needs, he needs to be able to hit a catch and shoot three at a, at a commensurate rate. I think if that comes around, the term I threw out the other night for him is a term that I've used over the last year, especially to describe guys like uh, Lonzo Ball and, and Tyrese Halliburton. They're more connectors than they are true point guards. Like they just, they make everything else work when you put them in there. Now that they're, you're probably not going to be a very good team if they're your, or like one of your top two guys, or even maybe you're, you know, one of your top three guys. But like, if you put them out there with other talented players and we saw Lonzo's effect with the bulls this year, we've seen Tyrese Halliburton do this type of stuff. I almost think Obi can be the big man version of that. And then when you throw in the fact that he is a one man transition, like different uh, difference maker in terms of how quickly he could get, he could get out. And like, if you have players who could get him the ball in transition, that's, I do think he also like, whether it's quickly or Rose or whoever, 
who he plays around, who he plays with is going to, and again, it goes to the connector theme. It's going to make a big difference. Um, you know what's interesting in that? Yeah. You know what I'm down for? This is going to be an unpopular opinion. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, I can't believe this entire podcast wasn't about Dodge Gibson shooting threes, by the way. <laughs> I can't believe this entire podcast wasn't about I can't believe the entire podcast wasn't about the 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 six minute stretch against the Charlotte Hornets where Taj Gibson took seven shots. Seven shots. That yeah. was one of the ones where I'm like, all right, let's I, I've seen let's it slow up. the roll a little bit. Ha, ha, uh, but, hashtag fire tips. But you know what? I I actually was from a developmental standpoint, I am cool with Taj Gibson playing with Obi. Sure. And the reason why is because he's the one guy on the team who can guard fives, but play the four on offense now yeah. because he can at least stretch to the corners and it's allowing Obi to maneuver in the middle of the floor. And Obi, when they play those lineups, Obi basically plays the five on offense and the four on defense. And that's a really specific fit. And if he's a bench player, you just don't maneuver your team to specifically fit a bench player like that. But if you can make it happen, I just kind of think that is the role where he is the most idealized. It might not be the role where the team is the most idealized, depending on what your team is. But if the entire goal of basketball was just make Obi Toppin as good as Obi Toppin could be, and this is the player that he is, and you have to do it today, what you would do is you would put him in a situation where he could play the five on offense and he could play the four on defense because he's a, hell of a, he's a hell of a roller and he can set screens and he's really good at kicking to the corners, kind of kind of almost like dream on greening, just on the short roll, finding shooters, that kind of stuff. He, he's had a couple of really good plays doing that. Uh, and, and I just, I like those minutes with Taj. It gets Obi some more gets him a little more comfortable playing that five role. And I just, I, I think it's good to see him in that role. Cause I think he's excelling when he gets those minutes, uh, gets him a little more confidence in it. And it gives the team and a little bit of an opportunity to be like, okay, maybe, maybe this is kind of how, how to use him. Maybe like, maybe he's just kind of a, a, a five off off season priority. Number one, bring back Taj at all costs off season priority. Number two, as I joked to you earlier today, work on that Alec Burks veteran extension. Uh, yeah, th- this is this is the way. Um, you've been entirely too generous with your time. A uh, couple of very, 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 very rapid fire ones uh, before we go. Uh, Tibbs back next season? Yes or no? Uh, pro- probably, probably, <laughs> probably. I gotta say yes or no. Yes, you have to say yes or no. It's rapid okay, yes. fire. You're gonna uh, get me aggregated, and they're gonna be. Like, I'm gonna get you reported. Tibbs is coming back. Uh, Mitchell Robinson back on the next next season. Mm, why not? No. Okay. All right. How you doing? Um, the Knicks. I uh, I w- was playing. I'll talk about this for longer. We'll save it for the next time you're on. Because uh, you wrote about uh, all the different draft possibilities for the Knicks earlier today. Uh, very enjoyable piece. Uh, yes or no? The Knicks. Uh, clearly, this is something you could report. Uh, Knicks jump into the top four. Yes or no? <laughs> Well, they, it, I, I don't know. They got, they got a seven point one percent chance if they finish with the twelve. You laid 12%. out the math very, so very, uh, very no. well. Getting down to ninth, the ninth worst record would be huge for them. They're only a game and a half. I think they're one in the loss column, worse than San Antonio. And San Antonio is trying to win because they want that ten seed. So, yeah. or, or not that ten seed, that tenth place. I just did what I hate. I hate when people say the 10 seed. There is no 10 seed. There are only eight seeds. There are eight seeds. Ninth place, ninth ninth place, place. eight seed. And I just succumbed to one of my least favorite things. Uh, they won 10th place. So, so if the Knicks could get down to the ninth worst record, that jumps their odds from getting into the top four from 7% to like 20%. It's yeah. a huge difference. It's massive. Um, Last, I have to ask you one non next thing. Uh, Russell Westbrook next year will be playing for what team? Mm. Wow, you be funny and say like the what's Beijing. what's the team? What's the team in semi pro? The Tropics? Oh, the tra- uh, we actually so semi pro came up recently on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, the Flint Tropics. Flint Tropics. Uh, I you know what? That's a good answer. Here's here's my here's my hot take. Here's my hot take. Oh yeah, here we go. Russell Aggregators will be right. playing. We'll be playing for the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh, okay. 
So no one's beating down their door to trade for that 40. What is it? 47? I think it's 47. I mean, I just, I, I, I actually thought that was, that was, that was a hot take. I feel like everybody's like, oh, Lakers have to, have well, to I don't think off it's, the team, but like, not to, not to I, spoil I your fun. I don't, I don't see think it's what, thing. I don't see what the trade is. I don't see what it is. I mean, I guess it could be that John Wall Houston swap, which is still going to be there if the Lakers want to do it, I assume. No. Uh, but, but then, okay, it gets bought out by Houston. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe there's something with like a, a team that just wants like tickets, just wants like the gate, you know? Like, like, I don't even think Russ can, like, like what fan bases are that? I don't, I, I, this is going to sound Russ has, Oh, I covered him. He has fans. That dude has like a top five individual fan base in the league. Really? Yes. It's probably just because he's my least favorite player in the sport. He's like Mello. Oh yeah, that's fair. He's like Mello. He just has an, he has just an individual fan base where it's like people who love Russ just ride or die with that dude. It is yeah. like very, very few players in the league. And, and he's, he's an attraction. People pay to see him. And look, I, I made my comment about him being the most detrimental earlier this year. He was not always like that. I was, uh, yeah, I, know. I was a, I was a rush should win MVP guy in 2016. Uh, he was, I covered him in OKC. I mean, he was, he was unbelievable. It's just, it's a sad way to go out. It's not, I don't think it's what Lakers nation had in mind uh, for this year. We can just say that um, Fred Katz, you are a legend. Um, <laughs> could you tell the folks at home where they could find you and all your stuff? Yeah. You could just follow me on Twitter at Fred Katz. You can uh, subscribe to the athletic, read my stuff over there at the athletic New York. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>